I'm so pleased all of you have joined us today for this webinar, Directions in Digital Scholarship, Support for Digital Data Intensive and Computational Research in Three Institutions. We have over 200 registrants for this webinar. And while they haven't all logged in yet, uh, we really have a lot of people here and just delighted at the interest um, that this has shown. We started this initiative, uh, although Cliff and I were discussing it uh, over the course of, of last year, but the initiative actually started in January of this year and included a number of elements that you see here, including two invitational online forums with 24 participating institutions. I've drawn from that group to highlight three examples of programs, in part to illustrate the variations among institutions. I also thought it would be valuable to include perspectives from various levels of the organization, all of whom have responsibilities for their library's digital scholarship program. I gave a session at the spring CNI meeting that was a summary of the institutional profiles collected and the information from the forums. The slides from that session are already linked on the webpage for this initiative and the resulting report should be available later this spring. You'll see the URL for the initiative on this slide and Paige has put it into the chat so that you can link um, to it more quickly. This program uses quite an expansive notion of digital scholarship. And I wanted to show you this definition from University of Colorado Libraries that I thought kind of encapsulated my thinking on what I was trying to demonstrate through this program, the broad view of digital scholarship encompassing all disciplines and encompassing uh, many technologies that either are computational or relate to data science, et cetera. So this, these are the kinds of programs that we're talking about in this initiative. Today, we have three terrific presenters who will give brief talks on their programs, highlighting institutional alignment, priorities, programs, facilities, and other items. I'll follow with a question for each presenter, but we'll hold your questions until all three have presented. However, please put your questions for presenters in the chat at any time, and I'll be reviewing them and asking them of our presenters at the end. So we have today Joe Lucia, Dean of University Libraries at Temple University, Nikki Agate, Assistant University Librarian for, Le for Research and Digital Scholarship at University of Pennsylvania, and Olivia Weichel, Digital Initiatives Librarian, University of Idaho. And our first speaker will be Joe, and I'm going to end my screen share and turn it over to him. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joan, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. I really appreciate it. Um, let me get my slides up and uh, hang on one second. There we go. Okay, are y'all seeing those? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so I wanna start just to, to, to give you all a little bit of um, context on Temple, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, so we are uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and interestingly, we have two Philadelphia institutions here today. University of Pennsylvania is a few miles away from us. Um, we describe ourselves as the public university of the city of Philadelphia student body size at present of roughly 34,000. And um, we take our mission in the city uh, with the utmost seriousness that drives um, learning uh, scholarship and community engagement. So just as a context. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our digital scholarship enterprise, which, um, relative to many is probably a little bit more recent, but about 10 years old at this point. And um, the origin story is, is an interesting one from my perspective, because uh, when I was hired by Temple in 2013, um, my appointment was announced, and I think it was in March of that year, and I was scheduled to start uh, my position on July 1. 
And shortly after that announcement, I got an email from a faculty member in the English department at Temple, um, uh, attached to which was a report from a working group he had um, chaired that had been um, comprised of members of a number of schools and colleges, their, their office of research, and some folks from the library, which um, examined the possibility of establishing what at that time was called the Digital Arts Sciences Humanities Initiative, DASHI was the acronym. And um, he had put that proposal forward to the provost, um, and, you know, telling stories out of school here, and was told that there was no funding to launch it. So Peter Logan was the name of the faculty member, and I began an email conversation uh, about uh, the importance of making this happen. And even before I was on site at Temple, well, we began a series of meetings uh, to, ter to determine how the library could effectively uh, embrace and implement uh, a group to support this work. So the initiative really came directly out of um, a small group of faculty and some folks from the library who actually felt that um, in particular, graduate students at Temple in um, fields where digital scholarship was emerging as a, as a significant practice were disadvantaged by not having access to support and resources. So um, literally, as soon as I arrived, uh, we began looking at our then um, main library facility, uh, the Paley Library. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, we were um, in that moment also beginning to plan a new building which uh, opened in 2019 but we had uh probably six more years of residence in paley and and one thing um the provost who had hired me said well was why don't you wait till you open the new building to do this and i said because it'll already it's already late for us in the game to get something like this launched at a research university so he gave me the green light to um invest in building out our initial um, what we called the digital scholarship center at that point it was not yet um, named and we we repurposed uh, a, a roughly 2500 square feet in our lower level of our building at that time we removed um, a very large installation of compact shelving that had um, housed our government documents collection and then uh, designed and built out a space that would house uh, what we called the Digital Scholarship Center. Um, we came up with a staffing model that was um, built around providing a couple of um, essentially technology experts from the library as support. Um, we defined a role for an academic director that, that would be a faculty member and that a position came into the library from our College of uh, Arts and Sciences. Uh, the, it was actually occupied by Peter Logan, the proposer of this project, who had prior to that been the director for the Center for the Humanities at Temple. Um, we also developed a staffing model um, before we opened that involved recruiting and hiring uh, several clear fellows to be essentially um, digital scholarship domain experts. So our staffing model was a couple of, of um, support positions from the library, a couple of clear fellows and an academic director. Um, and so we launched, I think in the fall of 2014, maybe it was in the middle of the year, middle of the fall, um, we put together a faculty advisory board. Um, we engaged Peter to bring his research program in. And the original concept for the center was that it would really be focused on advanced research for faculty and grad students. Um, within that first year, we launched uh, a program of faculty fellowships. Again, I pulled funding from the library to do this and also a graduate externship program. And the goal there was to essentially seed into the center um, active researcher engagement to bring in current research projects that were um, potentially reinforced or enhanced by, by having capacity to adopt and use digital methods. And um, even from the early days uh, of the enterprise, 
Um, thinking of back to the slide that, that Joan showed at the beginning, we embraced a range of approaches. Um, uh, so um, I'm just thinking back to that early T textual analysis, geospatial data, data visualization, um, some work with uh, digital telemetry and um, some site work with uh, digital reconstructions of historical architectural sites with our art history department. So it was a, it was a multidisciplinary research environment from day one. And the faculty fellows program um, got off the ground very quickly. We had, we've had five to six fellows a year. Um, now in our, I think this would be our ninth year of operation with the fellows and graduate externships, which we co-fund with the schools and colleges in those range. Usually um, the number of those parallels the number of faculty fellows because those graduate students are attached to a faculty researcher as a, as a research support colleague. Um, so uh, fast forward in, in, you know, in planning the new building, we designed a specific space to expand and enhance that uh, digital scholarship enterprise with the overarching vision that over time it would become more and more um, part of the core offering of the library, not kind of an isolated center that was focused focused exclusively on advanced faculty work. Um, so in our new building, we have uh, a facility that's much more open, that's permeable to um, walk-in users, um, that is actually a multifunctional space uh, in addition to uh, supporting the ongoing uh, activities of the fellows, uh, the graduate students and others. Um, that space uh, includes a maker space, a VR studio, uh, an AV recording space, uh, some presentation rooms, uh, workshop area. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a great multifunctional space. Programmatically, uh, we've expanded to support mini grants to faculty for the incorporation of makerspace and digital scholar scholarship projects into undergraduate courses. Um, uh, we've, uh, since we've been in the new building, uh, in spite of the pandemic, we have been sponsoring conferences and symposia, and we also have in place now a number of funded research projects that have come in either uh, in partnership with faculty or through um, the work of staff in the center itself. The staff complement has grown. We now have, I think, six full-time library staff in there, plus the faculty fellows, and then um, collaboration and partnership with librarians from outside the center who come in and work on projects with faculty. Um, we also are engaged in a conversation uh, with our computer science department around building out uh, some support for data science collaborative projects that will um, include workshops for undergraduates uh, potentially across the curriculum. And, and as I said, that's an emerging activity. Um, just show you quickly a couple of screenshots. This is the main website for the Loretta C. Duck, now Loretta C. Duckworth Scholar Studio. We received um, a naming gift during the um, campaign for our building from a woman who at that point was a member of our board of trustees. Sadly, she passed away before the building was complete and was never actually able to see the completed space. Um, but this uh, gives you a sense of kind of some of the core offerings there. Um, one of the ways you can get a, a clear picture of the sorts of work that, that um, go on in a continuing way in the center is that we have a, a WordPress site that uh, contains uh, fairly frequently updated blogs posted by by faculty uh, fellows and the uh, research externs on the work they're doing. And basically these blogs each describe specific projects or activities. It's a great place to get a sense of the range of things we do there. Um, and then one of the things I'm particularly excited about is that our, we have a, a really wonderful exhibit space in our, in our new building. And we are actually just about to open tomorrow an exhibit in that space that is about gaming and game design. And it's comprised, the exhibit is comprised of five projects around gaming that were done in the Scholar Studio to bring that work to a broader public. Um, and I just, these are a couple of quick screenshots uh, shots of the space. You can see it's kind of got a very deliberately an open industrial 
aesthetic. It's very different from any other space in the building uh, in that regard. Um, this is the maker space before it was, this was literally as the library was opening. So it was before it was fully populated with um, equipment. Now it's it's jam packed and I didn't have a current slide of that. Um, there's, I think, 24 printers in there now, two laser cutters, uh, CNC mill, just all kinds of stuff, uh, sewing machine, bench electronics. Uh, and then this is one of the break, we have four breakout rooms and a main kind of presentation space. And this is just one of the breakout rooms that we, that is available to students um, for general access, but then is used uh, in a more dedicated and scheduled way when we have workshops and um, uh, other kinds of sessions there. So um, th that's uh, the sort of quick overview and I'll be happy later on to take questions. Um, I'll take down my slides now and uh, hand it off. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, Joe hosted the most recent Designing Libraries Conference at Temple, and the Charles Library is truly magnificent. I would don't use that word lightly, and um, I hope you all get a chance to visit that space. So as you mentioned, the um, Scholars Lab has an open area at the entry point, and then there's some rooms available or some areas where it's clear that they're for specialized functionalities. Can you give us an idea of how the space has worked? Can you describe some of the early lessons learned about how you configured that part of the library? I'm sure uh, many here would love to hear your thoughts. Well, again, this was not without a certain amount of controversy in the sense that, you know, the um, the original kind of founding group had a very proprietary view of the space we created in the Paley Library. And it was really kind of a research center. And I argued from day one that the evolution of our um, mission space would be to open it out to the broader world and that we wouldn't create a closed off environment in the new building. So the, the current space, as you said, Joan, has dedicated areas that do specific functions like the VR room and the maker space, but the, the core of the space is a big open study area that students are welcome to come into and they use it to collaborate and meet. Um, one of the things that was interesting that we did, you know, in the in the Charles Library, um, we conceived of the facility as a mobile technology building. So we did not put very much wired in com computational resource in the building, but in the Scholar Studio, we put in 16 high-end machines that were for data analysis and collaboration. And we turned that over to the Campus Gamers Guild. And that is the site where our gaming community comes multiple times a week to do multi-user gaming. So we wanted to create a space that was multi-purpose um, and that felt like it could be used in a variety of ways. That creates some tension and some conflict around the identity of the space. Um, and it is not without frustration at times when we, for instance, have to move students out because we have a large event going on. So we'll, we'll do something like, uh, um, a, pro a projection mapping evening where we close the whole space down and use all the walls for projecting and it becomes unavailable to students. So there's, um, you know, there's some tension around how it gets used and when it gets used, but it, it's better to have it as a public space than not. And the underlying, and this is this is a kind of a bigger um, answer to the, to the kind of mission and vision component. Um, and I had a long meeting today with a couple of my staff members about the fact that our view of this enterprise looking forward is that it is literally dissolved into our entire enterprise as a library. And that so separation does not make sense. And one of the challenges is organizationally, what does that look like? How do we create it as a space that is embraced and used in more ways? And also how does it relate to the what I think of as the morphing of our mission more broadly in this direction? especially as we start thinking more and more about, you know, the transformation of information literacy into digital literacy and uh, data science facing activities, right? And this facility, I think, will be a, a core space for that. So the way we designed it anticipated implicitly a move in that direction. And, and you know, that, that involves to some degree a change of identity as well. Well, thank you for that, Joe. The um... 
these comments on integration into the core competencies or core infrastructure of what the library is about and what it does uh, will be something I touch on in the report on this whole initiative. And I do think is perhaps one of the most important aspects in terms of looking to the future. So I particularly appreciate that. So we're going to go on next to Nikki. You can start uh, doing your screen share. And in the meantime, I just want to remind people, I see one um, multifaceted great question that's come in so far. And I invite uh, all of the participants to uh, put questions in the chat. And when all three speakers have finished, I'll start um, asking them some of those questions. So over to you, Nikki. All right. We all good? Screen share loading. Okay, there we go. Yes. Um, so thanks all so much for inviting me to part of this conversation for the gift of your time and attention in what is, um, I'm sure for everybody, a really hectic time in the semester. So I'm honored to have the opportunity to join you and my colleagues and my Philly colleagues here to talk about the work of the Research Data and Digital Scholarship team west of Temple there um, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, when I talk to students and faculty about what we do, the reaction is usually like, wait, what, libraries do that? Li libraries do that? Um, and I like to say, yes, we're just getting started. Like, yes. So um, this is a really exciting panel to be part of. So broadly speaking, our group is all about helping the Penn community become not only um, data skilled, but data literate. And so we try and help our collaborators understand data as a decision-making process rather than a product. And to realize that through that process, data requires people, right? So that people whose lives and online interactions are quantified and those who aren't, uh, people who train models for analysis, um, people who visualize, promote, sell data. And it feels like it's our aim, no matter what we're teaching, to help students bring their own critical skills, the ones that they're learning in their classes at Penn, to um, the data that they're encountering in their research and to bring all of that into the projects they might build with us or um, stuff they might be putting online with us. And so this takes sort of these three main um, areas of focus for us, project support, digital and computational methodologies and research support. Um, project support is probably the most traditional sort of digital humanities center type um product or type element of our work sorry um and so a lot of it is actually done in collaboration with the price lab for digital humanities which is in the school of arts and sciences at penn um, a major difference between us though is that the price lab is sort of because of where it is in the school and because of the very because every school in penn is its own fiefdom you could say, and um, they have to serve arts and sciences, the School of Arts and Sciences first, right? Whereas we as a library can sort of bring in and collaborate a lot more broadly across the campus. Um, basically, what would happen is that a faculty member might apply to the Price Lab for project funding, and that money usually pays for students to work on projects. And then the research data and digital scholarship team trains those students and works with them to build them. So we have one sort of workflow for all of the research data and digital scholarship projects, whether they come through the price lab or not. We have a shared um, project proposal form. And so a couple of the ones we're currently working on that might be interesting. Um, there's a multimodal open educational resource that's highlighting um, diversity for Italian language learners, right? So a, um, a much, and it uses a lot of multimodal resources. We've got a collaboration with the Philadelphia Community College on slave revolts, and a collaboration with an English professor at Penn on the history of a newspaper that was created and published by inmates in a prison here in, in Philly. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in that project team on sort of rationalizing our stack, really getting our workflows down and making sure that we are documenting everything and approaching projects with sustainability of work and people, which we established as one of our core values um, at the heart of what we're doing there. Um, in terms of instructional support, 
um, that that sort of ra ranges across the gamut from multi-day carpentry events and workshop series. We did a six-week data jam recently. Um, I think libraries are really ideally positioned to provide the intellectual and physical space for students to come together in communities of practice. And so we really try and facilitate a lot of that through monthly meetups for users of R or Python or mapping and GIS. And part of the, the idea behind that is to say, okay, so maybe you go take a two day carpentries boot camp, or maybe you go take a workshop, but then what do you do afterwards? How do you keep those skills going? And how do you find other people who are sort of at your level? And so by providing these clubs, we're trying to provide ways for people to, to find, to meet other people across the entire campus and to work together and learn new things. Um, we're also working with colleagues to create a series of AI breweries right now, a set of open conversations that we are presenting as a sort of an unconference model that was spread out over the whole summer. And this is something we're going to be doing actually just for our colleagues in the libraries with the idea of having a set of open conversations about the challenges and opportunities of AI right now. Um, I would say mainly the goal with all of our instructional and methodologic, methodological support is to be as welcoming and judgment free um, as possible and to provide an environment in which any member of the pen community can feel like they can be met where they are to learn essential and transferable digital methods, programming languages and tools. And then our research support, and it's funny because, you know, people people talk about digital scholarship and at a certain point, like, well, isn't all scholarship digital at this point? Almost. Um, so our digital research support or research support is really focused on all sorts of data. So we do a lot of work with um, qualitative data, quantitative data, spatial data, and that's really across the whole data life cycle from finding it, curating it, managing it, scraping it. Um, through publishing and visualizing it. And so we've been working a lot recently with the Office of Vice Versa Provost for Research on campus to help the university prepare for and meet the new mandates coming out of the OSTP and the NIH. And that's been a really great um, relationship for us and our head of research data services has been particularly fantastic in building and maintaining those relationships so that the libraries is really seen as a crucial partner in these discussions about research. Um, this is an example. So we are like our library website has just been migrated and we don't have editing access to the new website yet. So my screenshots, we're all going to be very old, <laughs> but this is one that's from our blog. Um, like Joe, we have a blog where we, we put a lot of material that um, we're really trying to focus on process, sort of the whole like Miriam Posner, how did they build that thing? And so if we give a talk or a workshop or we um, come together and read about something, one of us will blog about it and blog about the process of making it. Same thing with the projects. Um, and we tend to Im embed the recordings of any workshops that we do online in here so that people can come to them later on. So, uh, brief example of what we're doing. This slide is just showing a little bit how um, the research data and digital scholarship work is aligning with the priorities of the library. So the library had in its strategic plan um, these goals around engagement and enrichment for students. And so I was trying to map what we were doing onto these strategic goals. Um, when I first started at Penn, which is three years ago now, which is why I can't give you the same sort of decade long history that Joe was able to give you. Um, one of the new strategic priorities for the libraries was a center for research data and digital scholarship. And that not necessarily a physical one, right? So the strategic priority in terms of social infrastructure, intellectual infrastructure, perhaps not, but maybe 
physical infrastructure as well. So we don't currently have a physical space. We are going to have what we're calling a proto center starting in the fall, which will really be a sort of place with a lot of modular furniture and screens that we can use to kind of have a home for all of this stuff that we've been doing, because um, up until now we've been doing it wherever we can book a room. And so when I was asked about the center and what my vision for a center would be, I really wanted to think about people first before I, and people and programming before I started to think about space that felt really, really important that we were able to build a team and to um, to work out how we work together. And so the people here, almost all of them have joined in the past three years. Um, we have um, and I'll show you the next slide and I'll sort of explain some of these roles, but everything from an applied data science librarian to a public digital scholarship librarian um, to a contemporary publishing fellow. And then on this last slide, I can sort of talk about how some of that goes. So when I was trying to think about the center, I wanted to think about it in, in terms of four main areas of focus, digital literacies, ethics and methods, um, and so for this one, we hired our applied data science librarian who has been leading a lot of the initiatives around carpentry's training, around the R and Python club. She's doing that work. And that was that work was created after a lot of um, ear scanning and a lot of internal scanning to find out what else was being offered on campus and where the get and where the gaps were. And then from that, I was able to create a, a position. Similarly, um, with digital projects and publishing, it was in talking with a lot of the faculty who work on the Price Lab Executive Committee or who are fellows in the Price Lab and who were really interested in thinking about how to increase the reputational impact of digital scholarship work, how to make it count more. And so I talked a lot with Mary Francis, who's the director of Penn Press, and she's also really interested in this. And so we came up with a plan to, to hire a fellow. Um, we now have a contemporary publishing fellow who's leading us through developing what it would look like to create the proper policies and workflows and infrastructure for monograph equivalent digital projects that would have both the imprimatur and the peer review processes of a press along with the sort of discovery and access and technical capabilities of the library. And so that's a really exciting um, partnership that we're going through here. The other two areas of focus for us have been on pen research data. So again, really like getting that head of data, um, head of research data services role and then getting another a research data engineer to support her has been really, really important to us. We also were able to beef up our geospatial support and then collections as data, which is our most nationed area of all of these, where we are in, currently engaged in an investigation into what it would, what the workflows would have to be to um, allow for the use of some of the pens, um, especially special collections in data projects. And, you know, we want to do this properly and be able to document like all the various library labor that would need to be involved in terms of metadata and in terms of digitization and then in terms of computational analysis to kind of create a, a, a blueprint for when we wanted to do this in the future. And we've been trying out some very light pilots using Jupyter notebooks and some of the documents from our Kaplan collection. And we're looking forward to, to seeing where this goes next. And I think that's about everything I wanted to talk about right now, but I am happy to dig in and share more after. Terrific, thanks so much. Nikki, and if you'll end your slide share, Olivia can get her slides up. And in the meantime, I'm gonna ask you if you could give us a brief answer and maybe at the end, uh, you might wanna expand on it. But I noticed in the um, forum, you talked more about building community than anyone else. And actually that had been such a theme in earlier CNI workshops. And I noticed that it was somewhat absent. Um, and I wondered if it was because of the pandemic, but can you 
be tell us just briefly some of your ideas or some of the ways you're building these communities. Yeah, of course, and, and maybe this comes from me just having been a community manager at a couple of different places, so I come to that with that kind of mindset, but um, I, for me, it's been really, really important, and I think especially since the pandemic, because um, what we have are undergraduates who've maybe had two years where they were not connecting with their peers, and then they come into a huge institution like Penn, and they and they don't have places to to meet folks here from other areas or we had graduate students who had, were in a similar situation one of the one of the easy the more lightweight things we did during the pandemic was we hosted a um, building your online presence or a series of workshops we created a cohort in collaboration with the graduate center and we got applications from all of Penn's 12 schools and we took 15 of them and then we met every other week and, and ran, ran them through a set of different workshops um, and worked with the Career Center and sort of brought them in to think about digital scholarship and different ways of research communication and digital humanities building. And they were all just so grateful to have a place to meet and a regular cohort um, of people that when they hadn't even really met people in their department. So that was that was a huge one. Thank and then thank I you. think uh, Nikki, I oh, think um it up. the time we need to move <laughs> on to Olivia, but thank you for that example. Appreciate it. All right. Um thank you, Joan. Um thank you all. I'm excited to be here and um, so I, I wanted to um, say off the bat that I'm the currently the digital initiatives librarian at the University of Idaho. Um, in uh, July, I'll be transitioning into head of digital scholarship and initiatives at Iowa State University. Um, but I've been in this position in Idaho um, since 2018, um, and that's uh, came about two years after the creation of our digital scholarship center, which is called the Center for Digital Inquiry and Learning, or CDIL for short, um, which was founded in 2016. And um, CDIL is a, a collaboration between the University of Idaho Library and our College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences, or um, CLASS. And uh, uh, currently, we have three co-directors. Um, they are our Associate Dean for Research and Instruction, Devin Becker, our Head of Digital Scholarship and Open Strategies, Evan Williamson, and myself. And I've been really closely involved in CDIL's activities throughout my time at Idaho. Um, so my discussion today is informed by my own experience, but since I wasn't around for its founding, um, I'm also drawing on conversations with um, my co-director colleagues since they were really instrumental in, in driving the creation of the center. So its history really starts in the in the early 2010s, uh, around 2012, um, 2013. Devin started collaborating on digital scholarships with humanities faculty, um, with Evan joining when he was hired. Um, then in 2015, this work started attracting a pretty significant support from our Dean of uh, College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences at the time, um, who really saw the success of those current projects, saw the, um, the potential for uh, grant revenue coming out of digital scholarship projects, and, and saw a need for continuing community building around digital projects, digital skills, and methodologies on campus, and a real need for a more formalized space for that to happen, because there wasn't one yet. So he brought together this group of faculty members from the library and from class um, in around 2015 um, to start discussing what this type of program, what this type of presence might look like. Um, that happened to coincide with the university offering a new internal grant program to fund new ideas that would farther their strategic goals. And um, that group saw that this funding opportunity as a, a chance to um, get some funding to establish a space that's dedicated to digital scholarship on campus and start funding some of the project work that was happening um, so a proposal for that funding was led by librarians and was ultimately successful. Um, so more than half of that uh, original funding went to establish CDIL as a physical space. It's um, in, on the second floor of the library, a room on the second floor. It's still in that same space today. Um, and it contains specialized computing equipment and software, um, scanning stations, virtual reality technology, um, large screens that we use for presenting and demonstrating and teaching. 
Um, and the furniture is designed to be pretty modular. So there are several desks that can be rearranged, um, large tables, a couch and chairs for collaborating and meetings. And despite being staffed full-time, CDIL is actually not necessarily a public space. So um, it's not a space where somebody can walk in and make inquiries. Um, although we uh, we do our collaborations and consultations there all the time, we just don't have a, a reference desk staffed in there. Um, but we really see CDIL's purpose as creating um, the social and the technical infrastructure for digital projects at our university to be successful. And um, when we're thinking about that social infrastructure, we've established annual faculty and student fellowships that have been pretty, um, pretty successful. And we also run annual week-long um, summer digital scholarship symposium um, for teaching digital skills and methodologies. And this setup has really um, let us start sort of a pipeline of digital learning. So um, those who are new to digital scholarship might not know not, uh, a lot yet. They can participate in that symposium, learn new skills, brainstorm project ideas, and then um, have a much better proposal for a fellowship the next year around. And um, when they get that fellowship, they work with um, my digital librarian colleagues and I, and we work with them to visualize and publish their, their research as, as websites most often. Um, we've also had a lot of success with those fellowships leading to classroom instruction. So if a faculty member um, learns something in the course of their fellowship or has a project that they're really interested in, um, they've been able to bring it into the classroom, have students uh, contribute to that project and, and learn digital, um, some great digital literacy skills in the, in the process. Um, and then those fellowships also have led to some external grant funding. So um, in, in those cases, the, the support for the fellowship, the work um, to contribute to it gets to go on because they've, they've gotten um, this external funding as a result of the initial project. And on the technical side, our strengths and our interest in CDIL have really focused more and more on web publishing. So the publishing of digital scholarship, um, digital collections, and more and more the publishing of open educational resources and, and open scholarship too. Um, and for this work, we emphasize sustainable technical infrastructure, and that's really supported um, especially by our development of the Static Web Digital Exhibit Framework Collection Builder, which we um, develop in-house. So our creation of Collection Builder really rose sort of organically as a solution for, for teaching and creating digital collections and now has expanded um, quite a bit through grant funding, um, through our, our use of it in several different ways for digital scholarship projects, um, through other institutions' use of it. Um, uh, and the, the, the great thing about it, the, the, all the benefits of it include um, building static sites, uh, let us approach our projects with um, more of a preservation mindset, um, more of sort of a collections as data mindset. And we're able to, working this way, we're able to create sites that last a long time. Um, they don't require long-term maintenance, um, which is really crucial for us because we're a small staff. Um, and they also enable us to be really agile. So um, to try out projects, um, try out ideas, adapt quickly, which is um, great when you're working in a digital scholarship context with a, with a scholar um, who has lots of ideas. So just to give a quick example of a project along these lines, um, our Voices of Gay Rodeo digital scholarship project was um, the initial project site was developed during a history faculty members fellowship with us. Um, and this is an oral history project. So that project um, website uh, that, that we initially developed helped that faculty member get um, additional funding in the form of a, a Whiting Foundation grant um, to fund the collection of additional interviews. Uh, which in turn enabled her to teach a semester long course to graduate students who she taught how to collect more interviews and they were able to go out, collect those interviews, come back, um, code those interviews and prepare them technically and then actually upload them directly to the site. So um, having this sort of uh, technical foundation already in place allowed us to um, quickly and creatively um, create a new site um, and then have these uh, uh, additional opportunities on top of it happen including that external funding um, and that opportunity for learning uh, for students uh, on top of the original project. 
Um, as, in terms of data services, uh, our, our space for um, data services in the library is quite a bit newer than CDIL. Um, it arose um, kind of starting around 2019, a group of our librarians um, started uh, looking at whether the data management needs of our faculty on campus were being met. So um, after an assessment, they kind of um, came to the discovery that support for research data services and data management on campus really could be stronger. And um, these were services not traditionally focused on in, in CDIL um, at that time. And this funding um, or this, this, this finding from the assessment uh, coincided with some donor money um, that the library had. It also coincided with um, a, a realization that on the first floor, there was a space that was being relatively underutilized. So um, that moving forward, um, that space was developed into what became the data hub. Um, and this is a, a room that's used for um, collaboration and consultation and teaching around data science and GIS research here at uh, the university. And in contrast to CDIL, it is an, it's, it's an open space. So there's a desk that's staffed by librarians and graduate students to answer questions when people come in. Um, and that staffing um, brings in the, the expertise of our GIS librarian, our head of research and experiential learning, and right now also our head of digital scholarships uh, and and open strategies. Um, so the, we and the other the other part of of the space too is being inviting and um, and connecting with uh, uh, partners across campus. And there's already been a lot of success in that. So the data hub's only been up and running since last fall. Um, by the time it was renovated, it was fall 2022. So it's still pretty new, but there's already been success in having um, external departments and collaborators um, in research, computing, and statistics use the space to host data intensive workshops, which have been pretty successful so far. Um, and I know I'm in, in, uh, nearing the end of my time, so I just wanted to kind of wrap up by um, saying again that these two services, digital scholarship and data services, are, are um, situated separately in our library as two separate spaces. Um, and the data services, the data hub being relatively new um, uh, and our library coming out of a recent reorganization, we're still kind of seeing how, how we're going to work together, but we're already seeing lots of collaboration already. And I think that's really reflective of um, an increasingly interdisciplinary focus on campus as well. So um, we're seeing uh, initiatives and labs and uh, centers across campus bringing together um, arts and humanities and sciences to pursue new approaches to things like um, climate change or environmental issues. And uh, the projects and ideas that are, are emerging from these groups, the student projects, faculty projects, um, need all of these expertise that we have. So the, the data and the GIS expertise um, and the web publishing services too. So we've already been uh, collaborating across our centers um, on some student fellowships in these along these lines. And um, I think that that sort of collaboration is, is only going to continue as this sort of focus on uh, interdisciplinary approaches grows um, at our university in particular. So um, that that wraps up um, my slides and I'm happy, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Olivia. I do hope that all of the participants can see both the differences and the commonalities among the programs. And it's really fascinating to me. And I think that partly it, it's really important to understand how you your program needs to reflect the particular institutional priorities that you have where are gaps and needs on campus what expertise you can realistically offer and and factors um, such as that um, we're going to go right now to the participant q a there are so many questions i know we won't get to them in time um, that we have left. If the presenters would like to message me privately and let me know if they can stay on a little bit longer after uh, the session formally ends at two o'clock and whether you could uh, stay and answer a few more questions, um, I'd appreciate it. And I see, for example, Nikki's been answering some questions in the chat, which is great, but 
you're not obliged to do so, but I'm sure it's appreciated. So I'm going to start with an early question that was for Joe. And the question from Jiwu is, except for the space concierge seed funding and project management support, what do you think are the key competencies and critical contributions, in other words, without which the research outcomes would not have been possible from the library to the center? So what, um, what makes your program successful or what, what are the elements, what, what are the ingredients, I believe Ji Wu is asking? I think there's two distinct faces of that. Um, I think the first thing that adds value and that added value from the very, very beginning was the um, integration of, of projects into a project management framework. So that, so that you know, the service we provided was to assist um, faculty and grad students with sometimes large unwieldy ideas um, to begin shaping them into a set of activities um, and, uh, and kind of uh, focused tasks that would use the tools in, in productive ways, especially for the individuals who are coming in wanting to pursue um, a digital initiative, but without um, a whole lot of experience in that kind of work. And so project management, I think, was an interesting um, kind of, uh, I'd say, added value um, from day one and remains that way. And then obviously that, that we could um, have a portfolio of, of, of skills among our staff that were um, kind of discipline agnostic to some degree, um, you know, and I think being able to address a range of project types, you know, from textual analysis to um, use of geospatial data to social network scraping to, um, you know, kind of visualization and modeling, all those, we, we try to have enough competency or find ways to draw on those competencies to be able to support different kinds of activities rather than be focused on one particular approach. Thank you. Um, uh, our next question is from Anne, but there's a, a part of it is similar uh, question from Cameron. Um, would love to hear about your institutional investment in terms of FTE, um, how you staff some of your things like your meetup groups, your consultations, instruction, and uh, I uh, and Cameron adds, how does your budget work? How how do you allocate funding for your positions? And if you can weave into that something about some of you have already shown us your organization or in your specific positions, but if you can weave into that also how people from other units in your library participate, that would be useful to people too. Let's start with Olivia. Do you think, uh, I know it's kind of a complex question, but can you uh, give it a go? Sure, so, um, uh, well, right now we have uh, three faculty, the three faculty librarians that work in in CDIL, and um, they are the co-directors that I mentioned in the presentation. Um, and we're uh, we we do the um, the uh, the uh, project work with our with our fellows. We're primarily fellow based with our with our work, um, and. Um, when we get uh, questions for consultation, um, where one of us is always taking one of those, um, it's a highly collaborative group. Um, so there might be a couple people working on one project, um, at one person working on another. Um, we have uh, a couple of staff that do work in our Digital Scholarship Center first uh, full time, um, and because our digital, because CDIL is also the place where we digitize our. Um, our archival material, um, uh, the, those that that is why they're in that room full time. And there is a lot of overlap in the um, material that's produced from that scanning, that metadata work. Um, sometimes it crosses over into digital scholarship projects or inspires um, digital scholarship projects too. Um, so that that is the the staffing that that we have right now in our digital scholarship. Um, 
uh, center, um, we have, as I mentioned, we're going through a reorganization and um, have a new department that CDIL sits within right now, which is digital scholarship and open strategies. And with that um, move, uh, we're hoping to pull in um, uh, more um, uh, ex explicitly, I guess, um, open work around open education, open scholarship. And that's already really been happening with CDIL. We have worked to um, create open education materials in a lot of different ways, um, if, sometimes stemming from our digital scholarship projects. Um, and now I think that's going to be more formalized moving forward um, as we uh, we have several um, open um open access fellowships um, already and uh, we'll we'll sort of just take our sustainable tech technical approach um, and apply it to um, to those uh, open projects in the way that we've been doing with digital scholarship as well. Thank you, Olivia. I'm going to go to a quick, very quick wrap up and stay on if you can. I know that Joe needs to move on to a two o'clock meeting, um, but uh, if you would like, stay on for the rest of you and we'll continue questions. I wanted to make sure that you were the first ones to hear that we have our next webinar scheduled for May 24th. Um, it, the theme is going to be what's next. And these will be the three presenters who just confirmed we had the final confirmation earlier today. We'll put out an announcement on CNI Announce probably early next week. And then I want to thank our terrific presenters for all the information they put into such a short period of time. Um, it was, I think, very valuable to our participants. And I appreciate the great questions that uh, you raised as well. So thank you, Joe, Nikki, Olivia. And I'll go back to the Q and A, and if you need to leave, please um, please do so. Um, the next question, I'm I'm not taking all of these in order. Some of them have been answered uh, in various ways in the chat. Um, a couple of questions related to storage. Um, Nikki, would you want to take a run at that? Um, how are you working either with campus IT or just within the library on questions about data storage for projects? <laughs> this is always a complicated one. So there's like one question is sort of the data that people need to share in terms of, of research data. That's that's one side of things. Another side of things is when people want to do text and data mining on data that the library has subscribed to, but I don't necessarily think has a really good way for serving up to people yet. So vendor data, that's another one. <laughs> And then the third piece for, for sort of a more traditional humanities style project, for the most part, we're using digital ocean. Um, and then for other their smaller projects, reclaim hosting for those, um, they are paid for and supported by the libraries, but a little bit on the side of overall library infrastructure, I would say. Thank you. Olivia, anything you'd like to discuss in terms of um, storage issues on your campus? Um, yeah, we well, when we work on our digital scholarship projects, we um, we we take a, a an approach that encourages preservation. So um, we're we try to prioritize preservation of objects and metadata, and um, we have a, a digital archive where we store those. Um, currently um, in terms of server space and serving um, our projects we work mostly um, with static projects and that um, makes it possible to serve um, our, our just flat html css and javascript files from a simple web server um, so we don't take up too much um, uh, space server wise either and um, the cost is relatively low um, so in terms of um, in terms of our, our digital archive space, um, it's it, we are, we uh, could we could be better with digital archiving and digital preservation, um, and uh, 
but I think a lot of people can. <laughs> um, and uh, and so we, we haven't run into any space issues necessarily with that, but just um, workflows and figuring out what the best um, processes are in order to be good stewards of that material is, is a bigger issue for us than, than having the space for storage of that material. I would love to follow up um, on and ask Olivia a question if that's possible. Olivia, um, so at your institution, so for us, we are not actually able to put faculty content into our digital asset repository. Right, so the stuff where our collections go, which is something we'd love to do because it's IIIF enabled and would really, really help because we do really try and take a static approach. So are you able to do that and then get all sort of the, yeah, you are, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, we're lucky we have access to a static server, our library's uh, server, web server, um, and we can, put, we can put our faculty projects on there um, along with our digital collections and serve everything from that server. And um, we just are relatively, um, you know, we don't have a huge library, we don't have an IT department in our library, and so um, we have the access to do that, right. and the, <laughs> the central IT is relatively okay with that because we're not we're not using um you know uh um we're, we're it, it's static so it's it's secure yeah. um, relatively so um we do have a few digital scholarship projects that um the the faculty members choose to purchase their own um url and uh and in those cases we um you know, we make we sort of talk through how that process is going to go and who's going to manage it for the long term. Um, but we make that an option too, if if some if somebody wants that um, instead of being served from the library's web server. Thank you. Um, question for me is uh, about whether you have some examples of projects in the science and en or engineering fields that they saw a lot of the projects that on the screen captures of your website that seem to be much more humanities, arts, uh, social sciences oriented. Would either of you like to re respond? Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit. Um, we, our, the history of, of CDIL is that it was, um, because it uh, was a, originally a partnership, or it still is a partnership between the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences um, and the library, that's where the majority of the initial projects were coming from. Um, and uh, we still have that support and that um, des desire uh, and interest from that college. But um, more recently, uh, we've been getting more and more interest from uh, places like the, our College of Natural Resources and our College of Education, um, who uh, are, are not, um, so, and these are projects that um, maybe have elements of arts and humanities in them, but aren't um, purely digital humanities, I would say. Um, and we have, uh, I mentioned in the presentation that the uh, we have a confluence lab, which is um, a, a group of folks from all over campus who are really considering unique um, ways to approach climate and environmental issues. And we have gotten um, a closer and closer collaboration with them. And that's where a lot of that um, College of Natural Resources support is coming from. Um, a few of our projects along those along those lines are. Um, a project on the uh, extinction of caribou in Idaho um, and uh, oral histories around wildfires, um, histories of wildfires in general. Um, so there is there's a growing um, and I think really interesting collaboration that's coming out of uh, um, colleges that maybe aren't more traditionally aligned with digital humanities work here. Thank you. Nikki, do you want yeah, to Yeah. Um I would say that we we collaborate actually really broadly, but the project, the nature of the project takes on a, diff, it's different. So um, instead of sort of going through our proposal process and building the whole project with us, it's usually much more based on um, instructional or methodological approaches where we might be teaching graduate students mapping and GIS for a, a program in education or in biology or um, text mining, certain like teaching text mining methods for certain resources, but it won't actually result in what we might, I guess we'd have to define a project, how we might define a project, but it would, it would result in a long-term collaboration, right? 
but the result of that long-term collaboration might end up being a traditional publication, even though the methods are digital. So I think that's the difference there for me. Thank you. I'd like to also comment that in the report, I'll note one example of a university that participated in the forums that said in one quarter, they're on the quarter system rather than semester, they had something like 89 different departments and units within the university participating in their online workshop series. And, you know, that's, I, I actually wrote that individual to verify the number to make sure that the recording um, and the transcript were correct, and it was. So these programs can reach a very wide audience, and I think um, maybe perhaps in some things uh, for especially those universities and digital scholarship programs offering workshops and things like Python and R from what I gather are extremely popular in the um, STEM areas and uh, but also increasingly in humanities and social sciences so they're they're reaching all, all kinds. I think that's right I mean I would say we're probably we're actually in the process of doing an annual report where we're counting all of the, the schools and departments, but I would say that wouldn't be far off it for us when it comes to instruction yeah. and, and consultation. It's just the difference between that and long-term projects. Thank you. Well, I think we've reached the end. I hope I've touched on most of the questions or that the presenters have answered uh, them in the chat. I apologize if I've left out your question, but we've covered a lot of ground and I appreciate our two speakers uh, who are able to stay on to um, answer questions that they did that and for their fine presentations. It's so hard to do this in such a short period of time. And I really, really appreciate uh, your participation and efforts. And thanks to all of you who are able to stay and continue to interact with us. Thanks so much and see you in May for the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for your questions.